So today, some people are watching this little game on TV. Some people will probably be watching a little game over there in the PMAC just a few steps away. I don't know about you, um, I find that uh, there are football fans that literally watch that game, and then there are others that are either there for the party or what? The commercials. Yeah, I wondered if y'all were going to say halftime, but it really is the commercials. It really is the commercials. They actually did a study on it that said 14% of people who watch the Super Bowl are only there for the in-between, right? And uh, part of that study also looked at what common threads made for those commercials that really stick in your brain, stick in your mind, your heart, uh, and the ones that tend to be most popular. And I wonder what you can identify that thread may be. What is it? Animals. Yes, somebody knew. <laughs> somebody knew from last service. I know there were other things brought up that shouldn't be said in church uh, in those, those commercials, but... Yes, uh, the thread that was identified was animals being used in these commercials. So think about it. Over the years, some of you were a little too young for this, but the frogs that rep uh, uh, represented a certain um, beer company, and then uh, the Clydesdales, and then uh, so many different brands that use uh, dogs or you know some of our most favorite uh, household pets that just seem to soften us and create some level of emotional attachment. They say that this research has shown that brand identity is more sticky when it comes to these very familiar parts of our lives that make us feel uh, seen or soothed or safe or even secure. And so it's no wonder that these commercials, even 20 years uh, uh, with, uh, with time of past, it, it are actually still with us. I don't know about you, these, these uh, commercials are ones that we tend to watch or at least talk about or harken back to our memory again and again. We dwell with them in a way that isn't exactly sacred, but it, it certainly does uh, show that our attention is directed in a certain place. So in preparation for this message today, I started to think about what does the concept of dwell mean anyway? And what does it mean and what uh, do we think of and what are signs of actually dwelling in the house of God too? Kurt Thompson kind of plays with this a little bit in this later chapter, and it's really profound what he identifies as, as dwelling, particularly the implicit questions underneath this concept of dwelling with God, dwelling with the community of faith, dwelling which that, with that which is sacred and life-giving. He says, in, uh, in dwelling, there are two questions that live within it this first question of where am I, and then a second question of with whom or with what am I living? This question of where are you, <laughs> it is a timeless question that's really foundational to Christian anthropology. God's really first question to humankind that can be found in Genesis chapter 3. If you read it, if you look at it, it seems like a natural kind of outgrowth of their kind of cat and mouse game that they are playing, playing of hiding and then revealing themselves to each other. But that question has a depth to us, to it that is not just about location. And that question kind of echoes through scriptures, whether it be the prophets asking it of different communities or even Jesus finding himself in a place multiple times in his ministry where he's looking at his disciples, his friends, the people he loves and has called from all different corners of their lives to serve him. He asks them the same question of, where are you? And with whom are you living? Who is capturing your attention? It's this same uh, idea that Jesus brings forth of wanting to know where they are in their souls, their spirit, 
um, asking a question that's pretty serious, sometimes feeling too penetrating, too intrusive, even too intimate uh, in touching the parts of themselves that sometimes are hard to tolerate looking at. Those parts that are too painful to hold for very long. It can be pain in the most uh, awful sense, or it can be pain like we talked about in one of our first weeks of considering these things together, that pain of looking at something even beautiful like the Grand Canyon or the uh, example that I gave about Horseshoe Bend. It's just too much sometimes. And these questions are the very act of dwelling in itself, considering them, looking at them, uh, giving them space to breathe in our lives, in our thoughts, in our attention. And so uh, when we think of the ancient Hebrews' response to this question, with whom are you living, their response was really their quest to dwell in the land of the living. Wherever they were living was that movement toward the promise that God had given them. And that place is often not static. It was always dynamic and continuing to shift as they went on their way, Kurt Thompson reminds us. So as we're thinking about this, uh, this psalm that Gabe read, uh, I think about uh, Rabbi uh, Heschel, who talked about this concept of dwelling in the point of Sabbath, really thinking about dwelling in terms of our time, not being bound by uh, literal time, chronos time, and literal space and location. It defies the boundaries of all of those things. And so, uh, when we think about dwelling, it too has this quality, this character of not just dwelling and looking at, let's say, a commercial and considering it on its surface value or meaning, but this dwelling in the way of God and the house of God has uh, both a present quality to it, but it also has a future orientation to it where it uh, has our attention uh, look in part to what is promised and what is ahead and what may be beautiful in store for us. And then it also has this past quality to it that reminds us of what is true, reminds us of the promises that are our own because of our life with God. And so it has this level and complication that is beautiful and true and good in its own right. Rabbi Heschel said, There is a realm of time where the goal is not to have but to be. Not to own but to give. Not to control but to share. Not to subdue but to be in one accord. Life goes wrong when the control of space, the acquisition of things of space, becomes our sole concern. So the psalm, hear it in that light. One thing I ask from the Lord, the psalmist says, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of God, to seek him in his temple wherever it can be found. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. This sense of dwelling, no matter where one is in physical space and time, no matter where one is in our own circumstances or in the state of our heart, is a critical thing for us to continue to consider and learn to notice. You know, I've been looking, obviously, in the news for different things that are always signs of life. That's kind of the lens that... Uh, that preachers bring to the world in some way. And there were a couple uh, that seemed to catch uh, my memory and attention. One being the most recent one, a, a very simple story article about a baby who was born in the Ukrainian and Russian conflict, that literally this, uh, this newborn son was uh, in life where they knew nothing else but wartime 
And yet still for this family and even in their own community, this very small sign of life was hope that it was almost a, a, a symbol of resistance to all that might seem to um, allow for death and uh, dimness in life to rage uh, around their particular world. And then Kurt Thompson brings up a, a story from a similar context back in 1992 in the months of May and in June of uh, the Sarajevo conflict. There was a cellist, you may have heard of this story. Uh, veteran Simolovic played Albignoni's um, Adagio in G minor in the ruins of Sarajevo for 22 days, not just an hour not just 22 minutes, but 22 days uninterrupted after the mortar shelling killed 22 people in a market in the besieged city close to his home. Now he played in the crosshairs of snipers and artillery and gunmen uh, amid the rubble of his town and when all around him uh, tragedy and affliction were the daily story of his life, with no end in sight, his response was to create beauty, artistry, and something that transcends language for us to communicate the hope that was true. Not anxiety, not fury or revenge was the thing he was peddling, not despair, but beauty. And the beauty he offered and created a pathway for others to cross in line toward changed everything. It didn't stop the shelling, but changed the direction and trajectory of people's attention and in some cases, their action in the wake of experiencing that point of light. And so for the Christian life, uh, much of that life is searching for beauty in the midst of that which seems unjust, that which seems hopeless, even in our lives. And I don't want to make any kind of direct equivalency to wartime that people are dealing with in real and tangible and systemic uh, ways to our individual troubles and struggles that often find their way eventually toward healing. But there are cases, maybe even cases in this room today, where we have faced death's door because of the battlefield of our own minds. There are stories that in ways uh, that I can't fully express are, are probably living in your heart or in your mind about yourself or someone uh, you care about. You know, one of the things that's true is research has, has reminded us that it takes about three seconds for the effects of criticism or shame to register in the mind and affect directly the contours of our perception and our, um, our comprehension about our place in the world. And they say it also takes not three, but 30 to 90 seconds for us to receive the emotional load of a compliment. There can be war zones in the world and different battlefields of our own minds, but we find ourselves continuing to be invited to dwell even in painful places and find ways where we might offer the good. I try to limit my exposure to social media to some degree, but I did find myself captivated by uh, this movement of uh, debate, I guess, on Facebook particularly, about a revival happening among young people, many much like uh, we find on LSU's campus at Asbury College in Wilmington, Kentucky. Uh, and so we find that they started a 
a simple worship service on Wednesday, and that worship service never ended, and it still continues over four days now, and as far as I understand, it's still going. Part of the debate was about its legitimacy. So I hear that the youth today learned about what's called a hermeneutic of suspicion, right? Yeah, yeah, they're nodding. They're like, we're so smart now. Um, And all that is is sometimes people look with a lens in their lives in a certain way that colors everything. And so some people were wondering if this was really legitimate, if it was ever really a thing. Did the Holy Spirit really show up, or is it just an act on video? And others, like myself, we can see that there is a way that the Holy Spirit No doubt, God's presence is very much alive in that place for those that find God's presence to speak to them in that way. But that isn't the ultimate and only way that God shows up, particularly not even in a sacred and beautiful space like this. If anything, what we know about God from the witness of Scripture is that God even prefers to step outside of these spaces, that we don't have to travel for miles to come to encounter the holy, that God often, if not always, shows up in the places where our question would first be, why God, rather than where are you, God, trusting that God is here. So for us, I pray that we can begin to dwell in the life of God, even in those spaces, whether it be thinking about the crucible of your own life and your own mind, or maybe even trusting that we can find the beauty of God, not just in a cathedral, not just in a painting like we talked about last week, but we can also find God in the anguish of our partner or our spouse, a child or a friend, Is it uh, a regular pattern for us to look for God's beauty even in the midst of struggling with addiction and finding recovery? Is it our practice to find God even in the most um, dead-end situations trying to find life? It is difficult for us to learn this knack for noticing, this practice of dwelling um, in hard things, compounded by living in an age where we uh, practice almost how not to pay attention rather than how to hold the gaze of our Creator in all sorts of different forms and ways that God comes. So in closing, the psalm that we read today this jewel uh, and gift of words of encouragement and hope and reminder of who we are in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the psalmist isn't really talking about living in a church building, living in even a permanent temple. It is this, again, floating, dynamic, tabernacle intent of meeting where God's presence lives. And it is this movement through space and time that we are invited to dwell and catch the gaze of, too, from the tabernacle to the holy temple to Jesus to the church to us. This, friends, we, friends, are where the Holy Spirit, the presence of God in the world dwells. We are the house of the Lord and each of us a pillar of God's beauty in the temple, uh, even in our brokenness, even especially in those broken places. So for revival that we seek, we don't have to find that beauty by escaping the world, but we find that beauty being born and stepping right into it. We carry the presence of God in you and me So may we once again become the ones in whom Christ dwells so that the world may know how deeply they are loved and claimed by a God who cherishes them. So all this we pray in the name of God who was and is and is to come. Amen.